Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let us pray. Father, we thank you that you are, you love us. You love us so much. And you sent your son, indeed, to die for us. To die for us. And we just thank you now that he's alive. He's seated at your right hand. And that we can come here and worship. Thank you for your Holy Spirit here with us. Lord, and I pray that as we go into the word this morning, that the word will be rich to our souls. To those here and those watching online. And those who will watch later. So we give you thanks, Father. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let me first start by commending you for coming out to church. This, you know, church is, church is nice when it is, you know, when, when the auditorium is filled. But today is not that day, and that's fine. But I, give you, I, I really commend you for coming out and braving the roads. But it looks like most persons here don't live in, in, the, in the carnival region. But still, that's fine, you know. That's good that we, 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 we can have church. And the young people are here. They are doing their... Um, youth leadership program and Sunday school and we give thanks for the leaders um, and we just give God thanks for another day and that he indeed he still reigns amen he reigns he reigns the scripture reading this morning was from Ephesians 2 verse 1 to 5 right I, I hope you're here this morning I'm going to read it again I'm just going to start my, my sermon title this morning is Made alive again through the power of the Holy Spirit. Made alive again through the power of the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 2, 1 to 5. So if you were here when the scripture was read this morning, you would have heard the scripture and it came from Ephesians. Right? And today, I'm going to share with you the gospel about Jesus, the gospel, the good news about Jesus. However, when I think of the city of Ephesus, which is where, of course, the Ephesians lived, right? Uh, and that the Apostle Paul preached the gospel. You know, when I think about the city of Ephesus and those cities that the Apostle Paul preached the gospel to and uh, in the first century, honestly, I'm greatly humbled and I'm profoundly challenged. He and others, the other apostles, preached the good news in a time when there was great hostility towards Christians. What they were preaching seemed ridiculous. In a polytheistic world where people, of course, worshipped more than one God, many gods, the apostles were preaching that there was one God and he was made manifest through a man named Jesus who was of all people, of course, the son of God, but of all people, a Jew. And the Jews were looked down on at that time. At that time. A Jew from a little town called Bethlehem. See, Christians were mocked, beaten, and many were martyred. But many people believed and were saved. Now, 2,000 years later, this message of the gospel is still being preached. People are still being martyred. But you know what? People are still being saved. People are still being transformed by the gospel. The Christian author was Rosaria Butterfield. She talks about her journey from being a lesbian activist and English professor to a Bible-believing Christian. She started reading the Bible for research and eventually it transformed. She was transformed by the power of the gospel. She shares how she was warned at an LGBT gathering at her home. She was warned by a friend that the gospel is dangerous. 
she was one to be careful because the gospel can transform. See, God is able to transform us. God is able to transform us and take us from being spiritually dead to life. To life. In, the message, in this message, I'll be sharing three points. Um, these are, I'll be expounding on the depth of our spiritual deadness, the fact that we are boxed in on all sides, and finally, that we have been rescued by grace and have life again. And my sister over there, Sharon McCrackwan, gave me an acoustic, acoustic for life. She says, it's living intentionally for eternity. Living intentionally for eternity. That's the next slide, right? And of course, I'm not seeing it on the screen in front of me. So that's life, living intentionally for eternity. All right, so number one, the depth of our deadness. The depth of our deadness. I hope you like that one. Ephesians 2, 1 to 2 says, And you he made alive who were dead in trespass and sin in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. In these, in these verses, Paul is pointing out to the Gentiles, Ephesians, and the Gentiles are the non-Jews. So if you are a Jew, there's either Jew or Gentile, right? Gentiles were non-Jews. So they were, he was pointing out to the Gentile Ephesians uh, that they were spiritually dead. And he was not just saying you're dead, but he was pointing out the degree, that, the degree to which they were dead. Right? So they were dead in trespass and sin. Now we're going to show you how dead they were and how dead we all were. Or how dead we all are. Acts 19, verse 1 to 22, details how much Paul preached the gospel of Christ in, in Ephesus. Right? In, in verse 1 to 7, he preached to the men who were believers, some men who were believers, but they, never were, they were never taught about Jesus or the Holy Spirit. In verses 8 to 10, he preached in synagogues, reasoning and persuading people about the kingdom of God. What would Paul have been reasoning and preaching? Well, could it have been the message we find in Romans 5, verse 12? It says, and Pastor read it earlier, it says, Therefore, as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all sinned. He could, have been, he could have preached from Genesis 6, verse 5, which says, Then the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thought of his heart was evil continually. It's interesting, eh? the verse didn't say, that every action of man was evil continually. It says every intent of the thoughts of his heart, every intent of the thoughts of his heart was evil. God looks into your thoughts, the thoughts of your heart, where no one else can see, he looks into your thoughts, those thoughts that come from your heart. So when Adam sinned, sin became innate in all his descendants, of which, of course, we are one. The problem we have is that the sin is within us. If our thoughts were to be broadcast for everyone to hear, people would just see how evil we really are. The problem of evil is that it is innately selfish and defensive. And I was saying to my son this morning that 
you, listen, we thought that you told a little lie, which we all do sometimes when the way we're being portrayed is in contradiction to the way we want to be portrayed. We, we, it, it's, it's a tendency that we do when we're not being portrayed the way that we want to be portrayed. And so we're trying to tell a lie because it is inside of us. There is sin inside of us. And of course, we have to be trained not to do that. So the problem of evil is that we are innately selfish and defensive. We want to, we want to do the, what pleases us, even at the expense of others. The good people, the good people among us, are the ones who have been trained not to act on their thoughts and desires. They, 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 you know, not to act on those thoughts that are against God. But the evil is still within us. It's there. Let's look on Acts chapter 19. So Acts chapter 19 is where, as, as stated before, Paul was preaching in Ephesus. You know, so it, 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 verse 11 to 20 talks about the mighty miracles Paul did in Ephesus. Right? In, ver, in verse 20 it says, So the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. It could have felt to Paul that Ephesus was being transformed and was becoming a Christian city. But there, was still, there were still people in Ephesus who were not saved. Acts 19, 23 to 29 says, And about that time there arose a great commotion about, about the way. For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith who, who made silver shrines of Diana, brought no small profit to the craftsmen. He called them together with the workers of similar occupations and said, Men, you know that we have the prosperity, but we have our, our, we have our prosperity by this trade. Moreover, you see and hear that not only at Ephesus, but throughout almost all Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away many people, saying that they are not gods which are made with hands. So not only is this trade of ours in danger of falling into the disrepute, but also the temple of the great goddess Diana, May be, may be despised and her magnificence destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worship. Now when they heard this, they were, they were full of wrath and cried out saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. So the whole city was filled with confusion. Friends, this is the power of sin in us the power of sin inside of us. Within the city of Ephesus, in which God was moving mightily, evil arose and created confusion in the city. The people came, the, 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 the problem came from within that same city. It's the same way with sin. Sin can rise up inside of you and turn your life upside down and lead you into confusion. Sin is innate, inborn, native to us. God cannot dwell. God cannot dwell with us because of our sin. Like cancer, sin over can overtake us. Saying you have no sin is like ignoring the cancer within. Indeed, cancer can be in your body, hidden and unknown and with no visible effects until it fully takes over your body. How is sin evident in your life? How is sin evident in your life? You know, I was one, I, I remember how I got convicted one day, thinking about a pedophile and how a man could ever commit such a, do such a grotesque and horrible thing. 
I was moved by the Holy Spirit to reflect on some of my thoughts and how evil they sometimes can be. I, I manage my thoughts and I, or I have learned to manage my thoughts and how I, I, and I try quickly to get rid of evil sexual thoughts, but what if I let them run? What if I lived in an environment that was sexually explicit? Could the sin overtake me? While I'm pretty sure that it's not going to happen, the fact is, the sin, the potential is inside me. Friends, it is also inside you. This sin has left us spiritually dead and eventually leads to physical death and judgment. The Bible says in Romans 3, 23, that all have sinned. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And in Romans 6, 23, it says, the wages of sin is death. So, I wish this was the end of the bad news, right? I wish the bad news ended here. However, it is, it, it, you know, it, it didn't end there. The apostle Paul goes on to point out to the Ephesians three things that has exacerbated the problem of us being dead in our sin and trespass. These three things have boxed us in on all sides and are closing in on us to ensure that there is no sign of life. Not only did Paul tell the Ephesians they were dead, but he explained the depth of the problem. Here we go in Ephesians 2, verse 2 to 3. It says, the sin and trespass in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we, Paul is including himself, we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. Paul points out three things there, the world, the devil, and the flesh. The world here is, the word world here is talking about the man-made systems and way of thinking, the systems and way of thinking of this world. Paul says in, that our sins and trespasses have us walking according to the course, the way of thinking, and the systems of this world that are, of course, against him. Hear what John says in 1 John 2, verse 16. 1 John 2, verse 16 says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. The world reflects the sin that is inside us. It appeals to our pride, which drives us to accomplish more and more so that we can reach to the top. And Jesus says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. The world basically tells us if it feels good, do it. Because the boundaries that the creator gave us for sex and life are too hard to live by. The world appeals to what we see and have us dreaming for more and more. Paul says to the Ephesians, we used to walk according, or you used to walk according to the course of this world. So there's a world closed in on us. There's a devil. He says, that we walk according to the prince of the power of the air. Friends, we have an enemy operating in the world, influencing and destroying the lives of people. As Jamaicans, we know there is a spiritual realm. We know about Obio we, and, 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 and all that, God's ring and all of that. The devil 
also work subtly in the hearts and minds of individuals planting seeds of doubt and deception and temptation. So can you imagine? We have the world, we're already dead in sin, but the world is pressing in on us. The devil is pressing in on us. And the flesh, our own flesh, is working against us. The yearnings we have for sex, for food, for revenge, and so many other things are working against us. Friends, we are in a serious predicament. Not only do we have to deal with the innate sin, not only is that the problem, we have to deal with our flesh that yearns for the world we live in, what the world offers. We have the devil that is tempting us. Even Christians who are trying to live intentionally for eternity still have to deal with an innate sin and the world and the devil and the flesh. Friends, we are boxed in on all sides without the intervention of God. We are doomed to fail. We are doomed to fail. Romans 7, 24 to 25, from the, reading from the Message Bible says, I have tried everything and nothing helps. I'm at the end of my ropes. rope. If there, is there no one who can do anything for me? Isn't that the real question? The answer, thank God, is that Jesus Christ can, can and does. He acted to set things right in this life of contradictions where we want to serve God with all our heart and mind, but I'm pulled by an influence, by the influence of sin to do something totally different. Friends, we cannot, we cannot live ignorantly in this world. We must live with awareness and understanding that our sin and what our sin, sorry, we must live with the awareness and understanding of our sin and what is working around us. We have seen the effects of sin stimulated by this world and the temptation of the devil that can lead us astray. We can be led astray. Peter says, in 1 Peter 5, verse 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Will he devour you? Will he devour you? I, I really hope that I've been able to paint a picture in your minds of how desperate we are. That not only we have to contend with sin in hate in us, but we are being boxed in. We're surrounded by the world, by the devil, and even by our own flesh to ensure that we don't make it. That's why there's carnival this morning. That's why there's carnival this morning. Well, I thank God that there's good news. There's a but God. There's a but God. There's a but God. Ephesians 2, 3 to 4 says, Among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. But here it is. See there? But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love, which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together 
With Christ, by grace, you have been saved. By grace, you have been saved. Amen? Justice or mercy? Justice or mercy? So here Paul, firstly, is including himself in the conversation. And I, and I want to include myself as well. That we all conducted ourselves at some point, and probably still do, according to our fleshly desires, and we are still battling with it. We are sinful, we are boxed in on all sides by the world, the devil and the flesh. We are all deserving of wrath. Justice would have us condemned to wrath. But God, but God who is rich in mercy. Did you hear that? You heard that? He's rich in mercy. But God who is rich in mercy. I hope you realize this morning that you need mercy. You need mercy. If you're watching, I hope you realize you need mercy. If you do, I want you to know that you do not have to worry because God is rich in mercy. He will never run out of mercy. Friends, it doesn't matter what you have done. What matters right now is the condition of your heart. Are you being convicted of sin? If you are, there is mercy at the cross. God is rich in mercy. He's rich in mercy. You may be asking yourself, why should I receive mercy? Why would God have mercy on me? Paul tells the Ephesians, because of his great love, which he loved us. Friends, God's love has no condition. He has chosen to love you, and he has chosen to extend mercy towards you. He did it for me, and I accepted his mercy. He extended to me, the mercy he extended to me. And if you're watching, and if you're here... And if you're in need of mercy, he's extending it to you because of his great love. Romans 8, 31 to 39, it says, What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? If God is for us, who can be against us? He... God, who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, and furthermore is a risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of God? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake are we killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Friends, there's nothing absolutely nothing that can separate you from God's love. Nothing that you have done, nothing that you th have thought of can separate you from God's love and the mercy that he has extended to you. Even when we were dead in trespass, God made us alive together in Christ. By grace, we have been saved. Saved. You know, we spoke earlier about what Paul means when he says dead in sin and trespasses. That we were dead, really dead. 
because of the sin in it in us, in it in us. The question now is, how does he make us alive? Well, God did this. God did this by sending his son to earth in human flesh. He came to us as a man born by the miracle of the Holy Spirit to a virgin girl named Mary. She called his name Jesus as instructed by the angel that appeared to her. This Jesus grew up as we did, was tempted as we have been and we were, experienced things as a man that we experienced, but did not sin. In not sinning, he lived a perfect life and was an acceptable candidate to be the sacrifice for all mankind. This was the plan of God to save us. God the Father placed wrath, the wrath and judgment we were all to receive on Jesus, the perfect sacrifice, so that he died. So, so he died and in, died in our place. It is this act of grace that has given us the opportunity to be saved. Jesus did not stay dead. He conquered death and the grave. He won the victory over death and the grave. Then, friends, he sent his Holy Spirit to empower us, to lead us into truth, to convict us of sin and of unrighteousness, and to help us move from death to life. Exodus 33 tells the time when Moses was up in the mountain with God, receiving directions from the, for, for the people of Israel. See, so Moses was bold enough to ask God, let me see your glory. Let me see your glory. God responded by Responded by passing, God responded by passing by Moses in a very breathtaking and dramatic scene while declaring who he was. He says, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, Keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers, up, fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. This is Moses' response. So Moses made haste and bowed his head towards the earth and worshipped and worshipped Moses made haste and bowed his head towards the earth and worshipped the song that says Bow down and worship Him, worship Him, oh, worship Him. Bow down and worship Him, worship Him, oh, worship Him, bow down. Bow down and worship Him, worship Him, oh, worship Him. Consuming fire. Consuming fire, sweet perfume, your awesome presence fill.
in in the in in the in hearing God's declaration about who he is Moses bowed down before him and he worshiped but you know we have more than a declaration we have an example of who God is in Christ Jesus and what he has done for us rescuing us out of deadness sin you know as I said earlier the Bible said the very thought of the heart a lot of times we look on the actions and we say well we're good people because of the actions but God said he looked on the thoughts of your hearts and we are surrounded sometimes you know as Paul puts it we feel like we're struggling because on all sides there's a world there's a devil and there is our own flesh that's fighting against us but God who is rich in mercy but God who is rich in mercy because of his great love has extended grace to you and so if you are sitting here or if you're watching online whether you're watching live or you're listening back to this this is your personal time to go before God and to admit and to surrender this is holy ground where you are is holy ground because God is there Paul says in Romans 1 verse 16 he says for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes for the Jews first and also for the Greek it is the power of God this gospel message you heard is the power of God to save you and if you believe and if you surrender and if you're in awe of who he is and what he's done and you confess your sins he's faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness first corinthians 1 verse 18 says for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing but to us who are being saved it is the power of god The gospel, the gospel has been, it has proven Paul's words legitimate because it still has the power to save. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your great love for us. Your great love for us. And thank you, Lord Jesus, that if we look to you and if we call on you we will be saved Lord you know every heart you know the condition of every heart listening even now you know what the, that person is processing what that person is thinking and I pray that we all will surrender even if we have already we will surrender once again everything to you we we'll surrender everything God doesn't want us to withhold any part of our lives. He wants us to surrender it all. That's what Moses did when he bowed down and worshipped. He surrendered it all. He wants you to surrender it all. And so I don't know if there's anything in your life you're holding back on. It's time to surrender it. And bow down and worship. In Jesus' name, amen.